All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to welcome back to MSL Capita. Uh, today we're going to be talking about creating a diverse, equitable, and inclusive vision in your sports or your athletics program. Uh, as you know, Capita is founded on the belief that coaches are just as important and responsible as educators in shaping our kids. Coaches and athletic directors have just as much time with kids. They're influential in their lives and we want to leverage them and leverage you so you can be a powerful force to create the next generation of top performing athletes and students. I'm joined by Davis, the head of MSL Capita. Davis, what do we have? Yeah, we got a good little clinic for you guys here today. So I'm excited to jump in here with Sam and, and we're gonna really kind of talk about what can we do as an organization to, to really change our mindset and, and really create a more scalable and sustainable future, not only for our student athletes, but for our communities as well. And just really focused on what's gonna be the most impactful, what's gonna be the most kind of, I guess, relevant changes that we can make. And, and really thinking about deeply how equity is going to be the for, on the forefront of these changes. So really thinking about what we can do ourselves, our individuals, our student athletes, and how we can promote that work within our own organizations. Absolutely. Perfect segue to what we're talking about next, equity in athletics. Um, when we think about equity in athletics, we think about players who have broken barriers. Um, and when you think about that, I want to pose a question to everyone. What are some of the benefits of bringing more equity into athletics? And when you see, you could check out our screen and look at, you know, we got Tiger Woods, Danica Patrick, um, a classic favorite, Muggsy Bogues. When we bring more representation into athletics, uh, what are some of the benefits? All right, so uh, some of the benefits that we talked about uh, for equity in athletics is that you get to inspire kids who look different. Um, obviously, there's people like Venus, Serena Williams, Tiger, Tiger Woods, Danica Patrick, Muggsy Bogues. These are all like anchor points for these kids where it's like, oh, maybe I could be a tennis player. Maybe I could be a golfer or a racer. And not only that, but it opens different styles of competition and play with different values as well. And sometimes it's just as simple as giving a group of people hope that never thought that they'd be represented or be on that stage with that many people. But here's the thing, as much as these uh, people have triumphed and uh, over adversity and fought for more equity in athletics, Inequity in athletics is very real. Uh, sometimes it's not, not giving the same people the same judgment or scores or uh, chances for representation in the sports. And also there are sports that have stereotypes based in them, right? Certain ethnic groups or genders or people of different abilities are geared towards more sports and other people are barred from those sports. And there's always inequity. There's always been inequity in athletics. Let's take it a step further. Let's agree that there are stereotypes in sports. If you take a look at this athlete on the left, you have what looks like to be a professional snowboarder. Now, take a moment and think. What would you say this snowboarder is? Now, if you took too long, or if you looked at the graph on the right, you would know that that snowboarder is most likely, almost 70% chance, a white male. And when you think about that, and maybe that was your perception, you have to consider why. Why is a male, uh, why is a professional snowboarder most likely a white male? Is there some kind of genetic phenom that just white guys are just incredible at snowboarding from birth? Or is there a more probable solution that's based on socioeconomic factors? Let's think about this. Snowboarding requires a lot of gear. It requires access to remote or hard to get to areas. It requires 
valid transportation, uh, valid and reliable transportation. There are a lot of reasons why the snowboarder on the left is most likely to be a white male. And with that, we also have to consider who is not being represented there. Because if it's most likely a white male, we're barring access to certain sports based on income, maybe based on education, maybe based on location. And then us as coaches and athletic directors, when we have the opportunity and position to recruit, we're thinking about people who fit that demographic. Not only that, but we also value players and recruit players based on certain body types. If I say a basketball player, first thing that comes to mind is a tall person, right? If we think of a, a tennis player, there's another image that comes to mind. If we think of a sumo wrestler, there's another image that comes to mind. Though for sumo, you probably do want to be pretty big. I'm going to say I'm going to bar access to sumo based on body type. Um, I don't feel that brave or adventurous. Davis, yeah. what about you? You don't want to risk that, you know, the repercussions yeah. of that battle. But I think it's interesting too, Sam, when, when you brought up, you know, some of these, even this image of the snowboarder, right? You think about the most recent X Games winners, you have, I mean, Chloe Kim, who's this female Asian American, and then you have, you know, a, a Japanese man that won the, the X Games gold this last year too at snowboarding. So it's, you're starting to see some of these differential pieces or some of these kind of more, I guess, diverse backgrounds coming into the sport, especially snowboarding. But at the same time, like you're saying, it is mainly backed by these stereotypes that have, you know, different disparities based off of socioeconomic income. Like what is the, what is the access that have they had? What, you know, where and how were they introduced to this sport? And you're not going to find too many, you know, urban centers that have, you know, great snowboard access. Right. I mean, that's that's the that's the hardest and most challenging thing for for organizations is how can we provide access for those that have no access and, and what can we do to break down some of those barriers or what can we do to create, you know, these these more significant and ethical pathways for for our student athletes. I mean, we're, we can take that. We just have to provide the gear, the transportation, the, these things, but that also requires funding. That also requires money and, and, and so on. So it, it's it's a fine line, but it's also what's going to be in the best interest for our student athletes coming in the future. Absolutely, Davis. I'm so glad that you said that point because that brings everything full circle, right? It's this idea that if we accept that there's not just, you know, white guys are born to snowboard and some people are not, and we have a vision of equitable sports and income, then the only thing limiting it is access and opportunity, right? Because if we get different kids at a young age going up the mountain on a snowboard, you have to believe that it's not just something men can do and it's not just something women can do and it's not just something one type of people can do, but it's just access. And that's the same idea that we have at MSL about education, right? Every student could be an engineering student if they had access to it. Every student can be a STEM student. And it's up to us to believe in their potential and provide them those opportunities. So let's talk about, let's talk about our goal. Here's the goal of this session. I'm gonna give you a moment to read it right there. And after you read it, take about five seconds to think about what part of that goal sticks out to you the most. Davis, maybe you could tell me what you think too whenever you're ready. Yeah, so I think the one thing that I like about this statement too is how we provide collaborative solutions, right? And I think when we're thinking organizationally, we always think from within and, and there's nothing wrong with, you know, coming up with our own solutions, but how do we think outside our own organization? Who else do we need? What, who else do we need to bring to the table? Right, we we don't know everything, and we can't always say that we're experts in all things, you know, amateur or youth athletes. So I think we can say, who knows the most about cricket? Who knows the most about golf? Who knows about this? How can we bring them and give them a seat at the table so we can have these conversations? Why is this sport, or why is this kind, this kind of 
um, piece really important to this development of this child or this you know student athlete? What can we expose them to, or what can we provide them that they aren't going to get somewhere else? They're not going to get at home, or they're not going to get you know elsewhere without a you know really strong or high fee. So I love that collaborative solution because I think it does. It takes that community. It takes people having those conversations, and sometimes it's difficult. But it's what's best. What's the best interest for not only our student athletes now, but even in the future? And how do we create that diverse pipeline of athletes? Right. And I love that idea because that's the idea that we could always learn from someone. And I noticed that the best leaders, uh, that's the mentality that they have. And if you're a coach or if you're an athletic director, you want to learn as most from as, as many high performing people as possible. And even you thinking about this collaborative solution is a way for you to become a better coach or athletic director too. Let's do the same thing when we look at the result of this clinic. So we know that we need a way to experience the benefits of diversity. And I think that there's one more advance on that. But here's what the benefits of diversity are for you. So I'm gonna say those three, in my words, the three benefits right here that we're gonna talk about are a multidisciplinary athlete. That's the first one. That basically means an athlete who's well-versed in multiple areas and is able to make neural or kinesthetic, you know, body type movement connections across different athletic programs or different sports. Then there's a mental solution, which is a broader range of problem solving. And that's having a diversity of thought on your team will help you to have different types of solutions. One person might think of one solution and another person might think of something else. And then the third is a communication benefit. And that's the benefit of figuring out who your athlete is and how you could better serve them outside of just being who they are as a goalie or a quarterback. And that's what we're gonna get through right now. Okay, so we're gonna look at this on our um, we're gonna look at this on our Jamboard. We're gonna have a second to uh, talk about each of these three topics that I just mentioned. But here's a research-based component for each of those three things that we talked about. So if you look on the slide, you'll see that there's physical diversity, right? So some of the benefits on that are different types of skills can be applied from one sport to the next. This enhances hand-eye coordination, balance, endurance, explosion, agility, and a variety of movements for your body or you know, your athlete's body where they can benefit from them and they can also avoid injury from overusing certain muscles. So playing multiple sports give athletes the time to heal and develop different muscle groups and different muscle patterns. My favorite example, I'm biased right there, Lomachenko. Uh, he's an absolutely terrific boxer. And one thing that uh, his father did was when he started boxing, he pulled him out of boxing and put him into ballet. And he put him into ballet to help him develop his foot movement and his movement patterns. And there's a, I think that he said multiple times, that's one of the reasons why he's one of the best boxers in the world right now. So let's take a moment right now, go to your jam board. And while you're there, I want you to think about if you had a dream team, if you could recruit any other type of athlete or group of athletes that you think would complement your sport, who would you recruit? What type of movement pattern would you want? What type of athletic diversity or physical diversity would complement your sport? Take a moment on the jam board and see what type of combination you'd like to come up with. And I'll put the link to the Jamboard in the, in the chat. So just click on that when you guys have a chance. Thanks, Davis. It almost feels like picking out ice cream flavors or something too, right? Like a combination of two things. What would it be for you? I know you have a background in hockey. What kind of a hockey type combination would you like to recruit? I mean, it really, you want with today's game and, and just, I think it really depends on 
you know, even in sports, but just like you have to be relevant in today's game. And and how are you challenging that kind of that status quo of what the those typical players look like and feel like? I mean, one of the people that I, I really admire, you know, is Alex Ovechkin in terms of his scoring ability, his natural scoring ability, his understanding in the offensive zone. But then you think about, does he play great defense? Not necessarily. So how can we get somebody like Patrice Bergeron in that offensive defensive mindset and really get them kind of playing together? And then with the, the finesse and everything like that, you have to think about some of those people that have the best stick handling ability. You, you think about like a Pavel Datsuk or, you know, somebody that can, that can really skate, but also really throw you off, but has ridiculous amounts of balance. So how do you blend those types of physical attributes with all these other things? Because some the game is not necessarily always physical. And like you've brought up some of these different stages, the, the mental piece, the emotional piece that I think are, are huge drivers too for these athletes' success is how can we diversify the different mental aspects? Who's going to be more defensive, right? You get the, you get the Patrice Bergeron's out there that are, you know, playing at that level, or you get the person that's really focused on offense, or you get that kind of, you know, cerebral thought of, you know, Wayne Gretzky, where he can just see in a different pattern in a different way and really understand people's instincts and where they're going to be and really play even though he wasn't the most skilled player or talented player, he just understood the game so much better than everybody else around him. And so understanding that, what is going to be the driver for success in, in that sense too. So I, I, love, I love that because you're also talking about, you know, with Gretzky, the, the aspect of mental diversity there, right? Like how would having a chess player on your hockey team benefit you versus yeah. like, how would having a gardener on your hockey team benefit you? Because they're both going to bring mental frameworks and mental solutions to problems that you have on the field or on the court or on the ice. And that's really what you want. Yeah, and it, and it brings creativity, right? Like, I think that's the, the biggest aspect is when you have those, like you said, that, you know, multidimensional or multi-sport athlete they allow them to transition those same skills or, you know, make them applicable in different scenarios. So if you have a soccer player and a hockey player, you're going to bring those physical skills, yes, and those traits, but you're also bringing that mental piece too, right? You're bringing those systems thinking aspects to, to a different sport. And because maybe they understand, you know, a pitch better than a rink, they're able to really comprehend, all right, well, my defensive positioning would be here, in this scenario like if how am i going to angle this person into the corner or into the you know into an offside when i can definitely make this move so it, it is that mental piece but it's also that physical piece that's you know kind of translates as well and and i think that's huge right and i think when you brought up the emotional thing that's another piece especially in hockey right emotions oftentimes get the best of people especially when there's penalties and you know fights are allowed but at the same time, how are you going to take that away from the team? If you're in a very aggressive player, you're going to be in the penalty box a lot. That means your your team's shorthanded. You're you're losing you know that momentum. So do you want somebody that's highly skilled but emotionally not very much? How do you find that balance? And what do you what can you work on and train? So and absolutely. And as we talk about diversity, what if you have diversity of thought or diversity of emotion? What if you have 12 hotheads on your hockey team? Now you got more than one person in the penalty box. And right. you have a coach that's feeding that mentality and you have players that are stoking the fire. That's why you need to have emotional diversity as well because you might need at least one person on that team who goes, maybe we shouldn't punch the guy in the face, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, yeah, it's just understanding the the social and emotional well-being too. Not nobody will want to play if they're always angry, right? And how do you continue that consistency? And even though you may be winning, if you're always angry, it's not a fun sport to play, right? If you're always in the penalty box, or if you're always in this, you're just going to complain and play the blame game and just start pointing fingers. And then it doesn't become accountability and the responsibility is gone. So then that just brings down the whole team dynamic. So it, it is, you have to have a dynamic team in order to kind of be successful 
And I think that's where that diversity piece comes in is it has to be agile, it has to be flexible, and it has to have different elements. Even though we all want the best and most skilled players, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to create the most and best team. And look at Team USA right now in basketball, right? They're 0-3 in the, you know, the two exhibition games and their game against France. You know, they may have the best individual players. I think this is what Evan Fournier kind of said. They may have the best individual players, but they don't play the team game, just like the, these countries do and what they're, what they're representing. So it's a completely different challenge. And how do you blend those different personalities? And as a coach and as an athletic director, we have to think about what is going to be the best, what is going to be that gel, what is going to fix these types of diverse, not fix, I should say, but how are we going to make these you know, diverse thoughts and diverse people work together as one collaborative unit? And I think that's where the most successful teams, that's where they find success is because they're able to do that. And they're able to build that responsibility, that accountability, that kind of culture of excellence within their own association and organization. And it falls on us as coaches and athletic directors. We have to own that piece. If it was indeed as easy as just recruiting the best players, then we wouldn't really have a job. It would just be get the best players and let them play and that's it. But it's right. really about creating a culture and creating a team. And to create a high functioning culture and a high functioning team, we need that diversity. It's not just a matter of, hey, this is what the trend is or this is what's the right thing to do. Like this is also speaking to the wants and needs of developing the best team. You need people with different emotions. You need people with different problem solving styles and you need people with different body types and different abilities to create the best rounded team who's most ready to handle a variety of problems as well. As you guys fill out the jam board, we're gonna get ready to go on to our next piece. So I loved what I saw on that jam board, a lot of great thoughts, um, but now it's time to step into some difficult territory. We have biases as coaches and athletic directors. We're ready to recruit a certain type of person. Maybe we think they have certain interests or they look a certain way. And now it's time to take a look at ourselves and think about what biases do we have in the way we recruit players? What biases do we have in the players that we're looking for? And what, no, let's start right there. And I'll give you a moment to fill that out while we go on to our next piece. So now that we have some of these biases named, we have to know that they don't come up from nowhere, right? How are we gonna create systems that counter these recruitment or organizational biases that we have so that we can get that diverse athlete, so we can get that person who thinks differently, so we can get that person who has a different style of communication, emotion, communicating emotionally, and who has that different body type that might give insight to our players. Let's take a moment to think about that. And that's on the, the next advancement of the slide so you can see that as well. I'll give you a moment to think about that as you fill out the Jamboard and we move on to our next part. So Sam, as, as a former athlete too, what were, what were your thoughts? Like if you were to be a, a coach or an athletic director today, what would be a system that you would like to change in terms of this, right? What would be something that you would, how would you engage someone else in a diverse group because they may feel like this isn't for them because of these stereotypes or because there's these barriers of access. So what could you do to, to prevent that? I love that. I love that idea because whoever th whoever's the most opposite group, I think I would kind of start there, right? This idea of like, who thinks that this sport is not for them? And then how do we reach them? Because, you know, maybe you're the football coach and you notice that a lot of your football players um, are also in the anime club. And it's a lot of boys because of that. It's a lot of boys who watch anime and play football. But I would begin to think, how can I get people who are outside of the anime club who might have a different style of interest. Maybe I'm going to the chess club and talking to them. Maybe I'm talking to female athletes who do other sports and see how they would approach the game. And I would start and go out and then work my way back in. What would you do, Davis? Yeah, I think it's, 
kind of like in the same vein, right? I think it's, you know, what does your, your community need and what do the people around you really want and what are their fears? Why are they, you know, what's preventing them from, from doing this? Right. And, and I think those are those conversations that might get real, real fast. And I think it's, maybe it is money. Maybe it is scholarship do dollars. Maybe it is some sort of like, they don't have transportation to the fields or they don't have somebody to pick them up afterwards. So what is it that we can do as an organization to really limit those things and really limit those barriers of access, I think. And, and it is, sports is a huge commitment for, for after school. And it's, it's commitment not only for the, the athletes and student athletes themselves, but for families, because they do have to arrange a separate piece of transfer, transportation. They do have to arrange for purchasing of the gear and sizing and whatnot. So there's a lot of commitments that go along with it, not just why don't you play? Because it's good for you. You know, it's, there's a lot of different things, but I, I really like your idea of, you know, building those relationships, talking to these people and understanding where their needs are. Um, and, and I think when you're bringing in that female conversation too, if, if it's a male sport or a male dominated sport, what do the females think of this, right? We were approaching, you know, having, you know, females jump in on football teams. You had the Vanderbilt kicker and, and so on kind of really become pretty well known this last school year, but thinking about what else are we doing to, to do that? Right? Are we actually actively recruiting females within the sport? Right? Could they play different positions? Could we ask them to? There's female rugby teams, there's female soccer teams, there's, there's a lot of different aspects of, of that, but how are we diversifying all of our pools together? We can do co-ed teams, but are there co-ed leagues? No. So what are we doing systematically that's promoting this type of work? And, and I think that's where we start, have to start thinking as an organization, what are, what are some offerings that may not be at the competition level, but more of that intramural level that are still engaging, diversified and, and fun for those people that don't have necessarily the commitment or can't commit to something much larger as a full season or all the gear or whatnot, but providing intramural opportunities where it may be less stressful, may be less hard on the, on the family. That's the idea of leaving an open door for these people, not like a narrow opening where it's just, hey, if you live over here and you have access to this, then you can maybe play this sport, but leaving a wide open door. And you improved upon my idea, Davis. I love that because what you were essentially saying was having conversations as that coach and as that athletic director. Who is football for? Oh, you know, it's just for guys who like anime and do this. And when you go to someone who's outside of that, it's like, why don't you join the football team? Well, no, the football team is just for those guys who live in this neighborhood or who act like this or talk like this. And we can't tell you those things and you can only learn those things based on having conversations with people. And you're, we would use the word stakeholders, but I would also just say people in your community is, is the word. Talking to your student body community, uh, community or families and parents, or uh, even educators, who is this for? Taking a look at our own stereotypes and biases. And le but let's go to the next slide because this is one that, that I really like, is that when you challenge your biases, you break the mold. And you, yes, it makes sense to recruit a tall basketball player, but when you find one who's not tall and has the drive to succeed, We've seen Steph Curry reinvent the game. When you think about, you know, a world-class level boxer, if you said, you know, a, a short, stocky guy from the Philippines, like 20 years ago, people would have laughed at that. But these people, because of their disadvantages, they turn them into advantages. And these are the people you want on your team because they're, they don't have all those advantages that you think, and they're going to problem solve and they're gonna fight and they're gonna shoot and they're gonna just compete differently. Would you agree with me, Davis? Yeah, and I'd say they have a lot more barriers to overcome, right? So when they when they look at a problem, it's not just you know a problem, it's you know, what is it that's different and unique about their situation because they have, you know, they have to overcompensate or if they have to challenge themselves to solve it differently. Right, like Steph Curry, for example, like you have there, 
is, yeah, he was a scrawny guy. How is he going to go post up against somebody like LeBron and go, you know, toe to toe with him? He's not. He's going to shoot perimeter shots because that's, you know, the only way he can get buckets is because he can't be physical. He can't try drive and charge through somebody, you know, that's 250 pounds. So he's going to leverage his skills, notice what he has, what his strengths are, and really capitalize on that. And now the complete game has changed because of, you know, how important the three shot is now. And, and I think that's what's so unique about some of these athletes is they have the, the capability of changing the game and how it's played because they came up with new solutions for their, I wouldn't even say deficiencies, but because of their stature, because of their, you know, things that weren't necessarily that stereotype. And because they could break that stereotype and break the mold, people looked at the game differently. And I think that's what's so important about us as coaches and athletic directors of allowing our student athletes to challenge what it is to be an athlete, what it is, what an athlete looks like, what an athlete acts like, what an athlete, how they participate and how they play the sports. That's what it's all fun and games. And I think that's why, you know, youth sports is so important is because it allows for that creativity, allows for them to overcome certain adversity and, and really problem solve situations that they're, they're not normally used to. So being able to give them that and, and learn from that and grow from that, that's one of the biggest things that we, we often overlook because we're so focused on winning or we're so focused on what, the, what a successful team looks like. You're absolutely right too. And again, that's another benefit of diversity and including these people is that you as a coach or as an athletic director will have to learn how to coach Steph Curry to shoot that perimeter shot instead of just relying on the strategies that are tried and true for you. It'll make you problem solve differently to have different athletes at your uh, dispense. So now we're gonna take you through a little bit of problem solving. Now, this is a this is a huge. What's the word I'm looking for? A scandal, the right word? Do I want to say? It works. Yeah, maybe maybe scandal might be close, but I would say this issue exposed the inequity between the men's and women's um, facilities and the NCAA, and. This is an issue that was national news and it just exemplified a problem of gender inequality in sports. So let me ask you, now that the women's weight room is allegedly up to par and the issue has been solved and they threw money at it, what would you do in this situation? How would you create more equity and inclusion in the weight room or with this weight room issue? Well, even to kind of go off that, clarify that a little bit too is, this if this happened right how can we solve it we can't just go and and make the women's weight room the same as the males right because we already established that we had this pre kind of notion that it wasn't as deserving originally so how would we kind of play that pr game and play that issue in terms of what actually needed to happen and how can we actually make this right because we made such a huge and huge oversight and large mistake in terms of what gender equity looks like, what can we do in order to, to not only look better and, and really reframe it, but also stand up for the voices of the female athletes that were so discouraged or that were so kind of, you know, put into this position that, you know, it's appalling to see the differences. And how can we really kind of take that a step further of, not even, not even just apologizing, but what are we going to do next to make sure that they feel like they're equal, they're, they're part of the same institution as everybody else. Absolutely. And that's where the culture comes in too. It's not just about recruiting the best players or having the most money to solve the solution. It's leveraging those voices, which leads us into our next idea that we champion here at MSL and at Capita. And this is equity and design. And on the left, you have equity, which is making sure that there's equal opportunity for people and genders and all different types. And on the left, on the right, you have design thinking. And we like to combine these two approaches. 
so we can create solutions that bring out more equity and create more win-wins. Um, here's the, the kind of, on the next slide you can see the kind of loose framework that we use for this. This is like Davis mentioned a moment ago, it's agile. Um, it's this idea of multiple iterations. It's a flexible style of problem solving. And you'll see that there are some key components in there. You have to notice and look at what's, what's happening, right? That would be talking to your stakeholders, talking to kids who are not being recruited, talking to families. You'd have to empathize with them. Why do they feel like this sport isn't for them? Then you have to clearly define that. Oh, it's they don't have access to it because of transportation. Then you have to ideate. You have to come up with solutions. You have to prototype. You have to try it. You have to reflect and then do it all again. And this continual style of improvement and thought and problem solving is not really something new to you. This is exactly how you've gotten better. This is exactly how you've tried out plays and you've refined them. This is exactly what you've done when practice isn't going the way you want it to and you've had to come up with another solution. This is just naming it, it's making it beautiful, it's putting some colors on it and it's putting the beautiful Mind Spark logo on it too. But you already know how to do this. Yeah, and, and I think one thing too is even though we put this together, I mean, design thinking is, you know, so prominent in the industry and it's not even necessarily always accepted widely, but I think equity centered design thinking is what makes it so interesting to us, right? Is how do we create an equitable future? And what this diagram really shows is kind of a linear model when in reality, it's not linear. Right, we're going back and forth, back and forth, retrying, failing, doing things over, checking and, and doing things again, testing and making sure that you know we understand what all the root causes are. So as much as we want to make it pretty and organized, this whole process isn't, and especially when it comes to equity. Right, every time we think about equity, we think about who can we solve for or who can we help address. But then we leave somebody else out or we leave another group or kind of, you know, even stereotype that we often overlook. And so I think it's it's really focusing on how can we really continue that process to continue ourselves and our, you know, self searching and that idea of what does equity look like? What does equity feel like? What does it look like and feel like for people that are on the outside and, and really understanding how to bring everybody in to that same pattern of thought in terms of how can we make this for everyone? How can we continue to change and evolve and develop our organization, our world, to make sure that everyone feels included and is focused on what's right and what's what needs to change? Absolutely right. Yeah, I agree 100%. And I think about it sometimes just in a, in a numbers perspective. You know, would you want to be able to recruit from a pool of 20 athletes who are more or less similar? or, you know, a thousand athletes who are all different. Right, absolutely. Let's talk about some of the root causes, right? So if you take a look at this graph, you can kind of, and we're using the, the weight room as an example. We can kind of think of the symptom is at the top, what we see is that the men's and women's weight room are different with the women's being much, much worse. But as we talk about the problem and the causes, what do we think is happening there? What do you think about, uh, Davis, when you think about the, the problem and the causes? I think, you know, well, especially with this, with this, this example, I mean, I think a lot of times it wasn't even considered. Right. There's a male weight room and they're going to put a weight room together, but they didn't think about either at first they didn't think about separating it and they were just saying it hopefully the best. And but because schedules were so overlapping and so unique and different, it was impossible and they had to piecemeal together something or it just was a complete oversight and they didn't even consider having a weight room for women. And, and I think they're like, well, we can stereotype women. Women don't lift weights, but that's not true at all. And we just continue to drive that factor. We drive that stereotype by not providing them with these, with these things. And so 
with, with the resources. And I think that's where we have a lot of problems is because sometimes it is, it's just, we don't even look at some of these issues, right? We just think and make assumptions and just hope for the best. And when we make assumptions, it doesn't necessarily bode well for anyone because we're just trying to assume what this position is, what this person feels like. And that's not empathy. And so I think when we think about empathy and equity and understanding what the problems are, it, it is, it's that lack of relationships. It's a lack of empathy. It's a lack of understanding of what, what the needs are for this certain group or what the needs are for our student athletes and just being able to identify those on a regular basis. How can we continue to address the needs? And that could be social, emotional, you know, physical, mental, all those different things that we listed before. And I think that's what we have to be really cognizant of as, as an organization is what are we doing to continually serve our student athletes? Not how they fit into our mold, but what are we doing as a community organization and as a sports organization to continually to benefit them? Because in reality, it's not about us. It's not about our you know bottom line or business acumen. It's, it's about what are we doing for the next generation and how are we providing them with all the resources and tools to make themselves the community and, and our future that much better. And that's what we do to make the world a better place through our athletic programs. Very well said. So now that you know a bit about equity centered design thinking, we're going to ask you to take a look again at the solution on the Jamboard. What would you do now that you can create something that's both equitable, as you can see, like reflected in this bicycle graphic, right? That's equitable and that is a design that could create a win win for both people and really leverage those voices like Davis was talking about so we could step outside ourselves and really get to listen to people. And again, I'll put that Jamboard link in the chat. All right. And as soon as you guys are ready, we'll be ready to move on. And we got something special planned for you. All right, so let's practice some of that, um, the equity-centered design thinking model applied. I'm gonna give you a problem. And we're gonna come up with solutions and, as a team. Right, so all our different styles of thought are all, all our different emotional styles of handling this and our, you know, our athletic backgrounds as well. Here's the problem. In a more affluent area, a golf course owner is struggling to find new youthful interest in the sport. What can they do? We're going to take a moment and in our what I've called, uh, Davis, this is new, you don't know about this, equity-centered design thinking tank. It's a thinking tank. We're gonna pull all our ideas together and we're gonna take this and form something really cool. I love some of the solutions that you guys came up with. A lot of them really exemplify that ECDT model, right? Equity-centered design thinking, creating solutions where it's win-win. Here's a win-win for you. You bring your team to the golf course. By doing that, you get a multidisciplinary athlete. You get an athlete who's working their muscle in a different way, who's problem solving in a different way, who's uh, beginning to apply different principles to different sports, and the golf course owner gets new revenue, new interest in the sport. Those athletes are bringing their friends there, they're talking about it, they're Snapchatting themselves playing golf, they're trying out their new outfits there. And suddenly golf is a lot cooler in your community than it was a moment ago. That's been my favorite solution. Uh, David, what do you think? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, when we were talking, I think some of the people you guys mentioned, it's like that top, top golf model, right? Like driving ranges aren't that cool by themselves. But when you add targets, when you add lights, when you add music, when you add like food and, and so on and gamify it, it's, you know, it's a bigger version of putt putt. It's, it's fun and it's kind of like that recreational thing. And it's not necessarily so uptight. You think of golf and you think of country clubs and so on, but this makes it that much more accessible and fun not necessarily I'm going to break the club over my knee because I'm so frustrated because I have to be perfect. And, and I think that's what I thought was really cool is because if we're able to challenge what 
the sport looks like and and understand that there is that fun part it is that you know it brings it down or breaks certain aspects of the game down it makes it that much more easy to approach right you're gonna if you're gonna go to top golf you're gonna have some fun maybe you are pretty good at it maybe you then you can translate those same skills to the real golf course and so making sure that these people and these teams and these coaches and athletic directors or even the the owner of this golf course is aware of how do we address this situation what is what are the youth in this community really eager to do and how can I make that more accessible to them? Absolutely. I think our, our equity center design thinking tank is ready for one more before we let them loose on their own problems. Here's one, here's your uh, second to last one. There's been several arguments about the Indian community using your team's field to play cricket before your team's practice. How can you apply the ECDT model to this problem? Take a moment on the Jamboard and let's use our think tank powers and figure something out. Again, a lot of good ideas. I love the idea of leveraging the Indian community there, right? Giving them access to sign up to the fields so they can use it when they want being able to have organization, and then also, again, creating that multidisciplinary athlete. What can your baseball players get from the game of cricket? How can they find similarities? How can you recruit for your sport within the Indian community to, commit, uh, to create Southeast Asian athletes and give them representation in sports that they didn't have before? Love those ideas. Yeah, and I think it's just, you know, learning new sports, it's always fun, right? How do you continue to, you know, evolve our own sport by learning another one and and i think baseball and cricket are even though different very different but they're very similar as well i think you know one of the things that i want to connect to is even learning croquet you know when i was way older in life comparatively to when i learned how to play golf so i think i don't play croquet often or anything like that and it's a it's a really you know different sure. sport or unique sport but learning how fun it was and to be, you know, super competitive as I am, you know, to play croquet in a competitive nature and just being like, I didn't know. Like I had no idea how fun croquet could be until I actually played it. I just thought I was just hitting it through little hoops and stuff and just going around and, you know, sipping your wine spritzers and stuff like that. But it's, it's a completely different game when you have really competitive people and just like, it's a, it's a fun long game, so why not? And I think that's where a lot of these, you know, almost, I wanna say like spike ball came from and some of these yard games and, and even, you know, was it cornhole and stuff? They came from people trying to create something new and simple and, and just fun, right? How do you use those even as tools for the multidisciplinary athlete that you keep saying, Sam? I think it's, it's leveraging different aspects of different sports to, to make ourselves better and, and just being acknowledging of that. You know, it's not taking away from, you know, our practice, it's, it's enhancing it. It's enhancing our community and our relationships, our communication and understanding and learning of certain games and aspects too. Be right back, we're gonna play croquet right now. <laughs> so let's, let's take it as we, as we end this clinic and we end this session, Let's take it back to you in your practice. There's no doubt about this, that us as coaches and athletic directors have to own this piece. We have to own the piece of acknowledging our biases and we have to own the piece of creating more equity within our organizations. So what's your issue? Name it anonymously on the Jamboard link that we provided and we'll use our design thinking tank to anonymously help you pool and solve your issue. Take a moment to do that now. And when you're ready, we're going on to the next slide. All right, this is where our design think tank comes to a storm, you all. We're gonna provide as many solutions as we can for our teammates' ideas right now and help them solve their issue of equity and acknowledging their bias. Don't make any of the ideas good, just make a lot of them. We're in a, we're in a lightning storm of ideas in our think tank and our tank is very conductive to electricity and I'm mixing the metaphors right now, but I can't wait to see what you guys have. 
as many ideas as you can right now. Not good. Just throw them all out there and we'll refine them tomorrow. So hit it. Uh, here at Capita, we hope that you got something valuable from this. We hope that we extended your thinking and we helped you to see yourself as more than just the coach or athletic director that people see you as and really value your role. That's what we're all about. Uh, we want to continue to provide you opportunities to engage with all your forward thinking colleagues, to do cool stuff like this with us. Uh, Davis is dropping our contact inside the chat. And before you go, please take this quick survey because it's going to help us get better and help us continually iterate and change our process to serve you better so we can change the world through sports. Yeah. And again, we'll see you guys tomorrow This is for the second part of this session. So come back with some of those solutions that you guys had filled out on the Jamboard and, and just keep thinking about it, ruminating on it, and, and come back with some, some better ideas. And even though Sam said, just come out with as many as you can, now this is your time to think and process through some of those. And, and really, what do you want to, you know, put some more time and effort into? And so tomorrow, when we jump back in, you guys will notice that we're going to focus on that as well as some other new aspects. So again, looking forward to it, looking forward to it, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. See you guys tomorrow.